Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour. This is your host, Bill Frezza. Pap smear is among the most common medical tests in America, leading to early detection of cancer in women, saving untold lives. But when it was first introduced, this test was extremely unreliable, presenting doctors with false positives and false negatives, leading to unnecessary surgeries and undiagnosed cancers. That was until our next guest, serial entrepreneur Stan Lapidus, an unlikely participant in the medical field, applied his engineering background to solve this challenging problem. With three IPOs under his belt, can he do it again with his latest startup developing a blood test for autism? Let's find out. Stan, welcome to the program. Happy to be here, Bill. Now, Stan, you, you've been an entrepreneur for, geez, three decades now. You've taken three companies public. You've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of the innovation process. Before we get on to Synaptics and the very interesting work you're doing with autism, take us back to the 80s uh, when you founded SciTech. In the 80s, I had had a little bit of experience as a working engineer. I, I'm an imaging guy. That means I analyze pictures and got fascinated by the problem of the pap smear, an important public health tool that had become, there's no nice way to say it, a backwater of medicine. And this is a ubiquitous test these days. Ubiquitous test, widely performed, 50 million times a year, and very often the answers are wrong. There are false mm -hmm. negatives and false positives. Women die because of missed pap smears. Women get hysterectomies because of missed pap smears. And huge numbers of women get a procedure called a colposcopy followed by a biopsy, which is unnecessary because the pap smear itself it's very hard to read. It's messy. And the cer and cervical cancer at one time was a leading killer amongst women? Killed more women than any other cancer till the pap smear became widely used. But it was a widely used and imperfect test. Mm -hmm. So what drove you to change that? And exactly what did SciTech bring to the table? By the, by the time I started SciTech in the, in the 1980s, I really focused on a burning passion to define my own problem. I think that's the heart <laughs> of entrepreneurship. And I wanted to choose something that was a big deal in medicine for which the value was clear and then we could protect with, with patents and stuff so that we could build a big business. Something hard and worthwhile. And I just looked at problem after problem and when I ran across the pap smear, something that others had overlooked, I stopped. I got fascinated. I learned a lot. And you had no medical background before that. You were an imaging guy. None. Just straight ahead electrical yeah. engineer. Yeah. I thought that I'd build a, um, a gizmo, a, a machine vision computer, a computer that has a TV camera that's attached to it that would take pictures of the microscope slides on which the cells of a pap smear are smeared and analyze those pictures. And my, my co-founder and I did. We raised a couple hundred thousand dollars of startup capital. Barely, and, barely and, a and, tiny and, seed round these days, but I guess it went a little further in the 80s. It did, in part because we didn't prepare ourselves very much. And uh, we, so we did a lot of, can we solve this problem? And we kind of could. We could find cancer cells. We couldn't find all of them. And we called a lot of normal cells abnormal mm -hmm. when they were not. But that we could find anything at all was a miracle. And the hard thing here for us turned out to be making the call of not continuing in that direction. We were getting better every day, but not getting better enough. We were asymptoting to something less good than the level of well, you need to be. You know, we often call this the valley of death. I can't tell you how many of my portfolio companies have gone through that, some of which came out the other end and some of which didn't. I mean, yes. you hit the wall. What did you do? Well, the first thing is we recognize that we hit the wall. I think the first step in not dying in the valley of death is recognizing that if you're, you're there, <laughs> turn back quickly, move elsewhere. And we did. And we realized that in order to get a computer to read pap smears, what we have to do is make a better pap smear. And people, not with a lot of attention, but academic groups with some attention, had been working for 30 years on this without success and quite out of desperation because the money was running out. I came up with an idea on a Saturday afternoon of how to make a better pap smear using a, a simple instrumentation idea. And this is the thin prep? This is called the thin prep. Yeah, yeah. It's widely used now. It's, it's, it's the default pap smear that women get when they, they get their annual. So you change, the prob you change the problem statement. We change the problem statement. And that is always an uplifting moment <laughs> when it works. We got out of the valley of death. Yeah, I, can't, I can't solve this problem, but maybe I can solve that problem. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The market vision never changed. Getting to better outcomes for the pap smear was the market vision. And how much did, and how much did you end up raising uh, you know, by the time you took this company through its full cycle? I think the company raised about $200 million from inception until profitability and then became a wildly 
successful business. And uh, and I guess the end of the story was acquired by uh, acquired by Hologic for something like six billion dollars, give or take. Yes. With that under your belt, why did you keep going? I mean, you've 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 done this. This is your fourth time. You're about to do this again. What is it that keeps driving you? I love it. It's easy for you to say that, Stan, but I know it hasn't been fun every time. We, I guess we first met when you were founding Helicos Biosciences, which was a very challenging uh, experience for, for, for everybody in the DNA sequencing space. You know, you have your ups, downs, and sideways in this business. I, I think success comes through a lot of daily failure and the ability to overcome this day and that day and, and the next day, optimism and resilience are the character traits of entrepreneurs. Well, and I, and I guess tolerance for ambiguity and willing to go without for periods of time. I know some of our companies that have gone through the valley of death and, and had the founders raise their hands and go six months, nine months without salary. That's, that's not the kind of thing a corporate employee does very often. That's right. So you have to believe in yourself. You have to not be a fool. But resilience and being monomaniacal are actually not the <laughs> yeah, same thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it pers- pers- perseverance in, a, in an impossible task can sometimes, uh, can sometimes lead you into bad places. Stan, let's switch gears and come back to the present. Your latest entrepreneurial foray is a company right here in Lexington, Mass, named Synaptics, is developing an early-stage autism test, which ought to be of great interest to people who follow the field. Stan, maybe we can start with discussing the so-called autism epidemic. If you look at diagnosis rate in any event of autism, it seems to be skyrocketing, growing every year. There's some uh, concern and controversy over whether there are increased incidents of autism or just increased diagnosis of autism. Maybe you can start by defining the, the problem. So autism is a disorder which has three classes of symptoms, speech and language impairment, social impairment, and repetitive behaviors. Roughly, the current rate is between 1 in 50 and 1 per 100 in every, every year. I mean, just about all of us have at least one friend yeah. with an autistic child, and, and we watch their challenges. In the 1940s, the rate was zero before autism had a name. The symptoms were called childhood schizophrenia back then. But 20 years ago, the rate was one out of 1,000. The rate has increased steadily about 20% per year, and no one knows why. There are plenty of theories. There's plenty of I think I understand it, but there is absolutely no consensus, and I can't explain it. And it's actually now defined as a spectrum disorder rather than a a single ailment. That's right, which means that it's a complex presentation of a disorder that's diagnosed clinically. There's no blood test, no X-ray, no MRI, no colonoscopy that you can do to diagnose So it's it's a judgment call, and in fact, it really wears on parents being alert enough to, to think, hey, maybe we have a problem here and we should have it looked at. That's right. And the difficulty here is in getting aware, getting concerned early enough. All children, in fact, are different. But a small fraction of children that are different in terms of hitting speech milestones and other milestones wind up on the autism spectrum. So what is what is Synaptic setting out to do? Well, we're setting up to dramatically, we hope, shorten the time to go from suspicion to diagnosis. Today, it's about a three year journey. Median age is four and a half. We'd like to see that age come down substantially. And why does that matter? Children with autism have much better outcomes if they begin behavioral therapy early. There are no drugs, but there is behavioral therapy. Think of it as parenting on steroids done very intensively, 40 hours a week, nonstop, eye-to-eye contact, structured play, structured activity. So exercising the brain in a way that strengthens the weak links that need to be built up to, to lead a normal life. Exercising that exactly that part of the brain, which is really about social intercourse. So, if you could have a blood test at birth, wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be ideal. Before you could have a blood test at birth, because those studies take a long time, you do a child at birth, and then you follow the child for three years mm-hmm. and see which one percent of those kids. Yeah, so get you got to follow a lot of them. You got to follow a lot of them, and you have to have a test which is pretty close to perfect. But if you set it a little differently, if all we did today was focus on parents who had a concern now, their child's 18 months. Very often, pediatricians will say, quite rightly, let's uh, wait go and to see. the pathologist, mm-hmm. wait and see. That's the proper default given today's choices. If we could have a blood test that significantly increases the demonstrable risk of that child having autism, we'll get that child into a referral setting sooner, the child will have a diagnosis sooner, 
begin behavioral therapy sooner and possibly have a, a better outcome. From the point of view of building a product, building a company, and not digging too deep a hole in the ground with your investor dollars, if you start out at that suspicion stage, you've now got an enriched population. You've got fewer people to, to follow. That's right. We believe it represents a strong value proposition and requires a reasonable amount of investment and a reasonable amount of risk. And how would, how would you define that? I mean, I know having been an investor in the med tech space, having gotten our heads handed to us often enough that we have left the field, clearly in the, in the mainstream venture capital space, a lot of the bloom is off the rose in, in diagnostics. What are you doing different and, and how, is that, uh, how are the challenges of the environment uh, affected you when you did your fundraising? I think what we're doing different is trying to rethink every aspect of what it takes to bring a test to market. The things we're not rethinking, I should hasten to say, are doing good science and building a broad consensus in the scientific community. Mm -hmm. But what is needed broadly is an understanding that the traditional retail selling model, the traditional hand-to-hand -hand combat in securing reimbursement are two of the reasons why investors have left healthcare mm -hmm. investing in droves. Well, not to mention the Obamacare uh, medical device tax. That's not uh, an in inducement either. It's not. So where did you, where did you end up uh, having to go to raise money? And, and to the extent that you can share, you know, where are you in that course? So we've raised over $30 million to date, $25 million of which in the last year, in the last 12 mm -hmm. months. And we, we had a core group of committed venture capitalists who re-up their investment, but also brought in three prominent investment groups that I'd call non-traditional. Mm -hmm. The first is LabCorp, a very large laboratory testing company with whom, through my earlier companies, have had a business relationship. The Kraft Group, which owns the local football team, have as a family and as a business a commitment to innovation in healthcare. And finally, Google Ventures, which views Synaptics as a company which can operate at scale and which, in fact, is very data heavy, given their commitment to organizing all the world's information, looking at DNA and looking at RNA is entirely within their wheelhouse. Yeah, it's, it's really been interesting to watch Google expand its footprint out of the classic IT areas and into spaces like uh, healthcare and medtech. They have. Increasingly, healthcare is big data, just like search is big data. Can you imagine a day where, you know, and I'm way into the future, where it's st standard for every baby to get this blood test, the data goes into a giant database, and now the, the, the job of collecting all the information you need to refine your diagnosis uh, becomes easier and easier? We view the development of a test like ours as taking place in stages, initially focusing on the highest risk children as, as test performance improves and we move back in age to younger ages, our goal is ultimately to test every child at birth or near birth. And what do you see ahead in terms of you know, how much money is going to take to get you to your goal? 30 million sounds like a lot, but I know in the development of, of medical technology, that's just your opening bid. Yes. I hope and our investors hope that it won't take the amount of money that it took Cytic to turn the corner, which, as I mentioned, was about $200 million, <laughs> and it'll be more than $30 million. So this is not a business for the faint of heart. Give us a look at the current status. Where are you in, the, in that long journey? We developed technology. We did a retrospective clinical study on 270 samples. Which means you're looking, you're looking back. We're right. looking back on bloods that were collected over a five-year period. Mm -hmm. We got a result that exceeded what's called our predefined cutoff. And so we kicked off just in April the world's largest study on autism diagnostics. So it's a 20-site study with the recruitment goal of 660 patients. We're substantially into the recruitment cycle. We've had excellent, excellent response from parents and excellent response yeah, from I, I, I suspect you get a lot of help and cooperation both from parents and from the various advocacy organizations that are focused on this area. We do, and from pediatricians. One of the heartening things here is to see that pediatricians, developmental pediatricians, psychologists recognize that uh, we may be able to contribute in an important way to the, to the journey of families. In a few minutes we have left, uh, Stan, tell us how people can learn more. Two ways. I'd, I'd certainly recommend the Autism Speaks website, autismspeaks.org, and our website, synaptics.com. And spell that, because I know it's a funny spelling. Synaptics is S-Y-N-A-P-D-X. Stan, thank you so much. Thanks for being with the program, and, uh, and we hope to have you back for an update uh, as you get further along. You're welcome, Bill.